let's uh, kick off in Geneva, where it was revealed in the press yesterday that the biggest industry is not tourism, but it is commodity trading. So Rustin Edwards, head of fuel oil procurement, Euronav, no pressure from the Swiss government. Um, prices rising this morning, but we're struggling to hold above 70, despite the fact that we've had missiles raining down on Aramco and OPEC have kept their supply shut in. Um, yeah, good morning, Sean. Good morning, everybody. Happy belated uh, International Women's Day to everybody. Um, the, um, it, it's an interesting market. I mean, we did have the spike yesterday up above $71 on the back of the missile, missile headlines. But the missile attacks happen almost regularly, it seems. I mean, it's, it's part of the headline news uh, feed, and it almost can fade into the back, back pages unless there's an actual strike with actual damage. Um, so I think the market sold into that rally, which is probably the proper news. And you know, now we've got crude going back uh, down again today. I mean, the $3 trading range yesterday is endemic of a market that's gone toppy. Um, I mean, I look at the way uh, OPEC's been managing it. They've had really good discipline, uh, which has kept enough oil off the market. However, the problem with this uh, rapid increase in the front month curve, pushing things into this large backwardation structure, refining margins on the back end have not been keeping up. I mean, so we've got distillate cracks getting hammered across the world. Um, there was a spike in the margin in uh, U.S. Gulf Coast on the back of the refinery shutdowns, but that's starting to come off now as well as refineries come back in the running. And the actual demand picture is still not as strong as the front month crude would make you think. Um, so I think, you know, we've, we've probably hit a short term top here and we probably pull back. Lori, welcome back. Lori Hattayan, MENA Director at the Natural Resource Governance Institute in Beirut. Lori, your thoughts coming out of the OPEC surprise last week? Well, uh, I think it was a smooth surprise, let's say, because they were, they, there was agreement. From what I see, it's like the uh, Saudis and the oil producers that have like really difficult economic situation were happy to, to continue the cuts to see the prices up because they need the prices up. And for the Russians, I guess, like they're getting a sense of shale not coming back as they expected with high prices. So I think that this time it was a smooth decision like to roll over. Again, surprise, surprise, because we've been, we've been in your show and everyone was saying like, no, a production will come back. And there was a possibility to come back this time with 1 million and plus, but we see that they've taken another route. So, uh, but I guess like the main, the main, uh, I guess the main uh, objective was to keep the prices high because they know that they cannot keep it for long that high. And yesterday, Patrick Pioné, the CEO and president of Total said it. He said like the natural prices or the normal prices should be around 50 to so $60. And now today we're talking about 70, but very difficult to see the 70 hanging on. So I guess like, and before that, if you remember, uh, Alexander Novak was saying that guys, uh, yes, we are maybe a bit greedy, but we have to accept prices between $45 and $65. So I guess like everybody is no, uh, guessing that maybe $60, $65 could be the normal price. But what we're seeing today is an exception. And I'm sure the producing countries like Saudi Arabia, Iraq, the, the other GCC countries are happy to see these prices up. Well, so it's, that they it's, could certainly, make it certainly takes their fiscal balance sheets back closer to break even. Let's welcome Homayoun Falakshahi, excuse if I've got that pronunciation wrong, senior commodity analyst at Kepler. Uh, perhaps you can uh, guide us on that, Homayoun. But I do notice that you're actually using the light from your window to shine on your face. That's got to be a first for London at this spring. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, hi, Sean. And, um, um, and welcome. <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Thanks very much. Um, Do you think that uh, OPEC Plus were correct last week in, in forecasting that maybe there is uncertainty about more barrels from OPEC? Yes, actually, yes, absolutely. And, and and just by the way, let me uh, let me thank you on the pronunciation of my name, which was uh, absolutely perfect. Oh, uh, but yes, absolutely. I think um, OPEC Plus took a decision that it seems, even though it came as a surprise, it seems that they, they had to take this one. Uh, and by that, I mean that um, 
if you look at the balance between the beginning of the year and uh, and, w- and when the meeting uh, happened to, so uh, a few days ago, it seems that that balance wasn't that large between uh, supply and demand. So uh, demand hasn't really picked up uh, globally as much as I think OPEC Plus um, thought at the beginning of, of the year that it, it, it would do. Uh, and so just by looking at you know global onshore oil inventories, since uh, the middle, since the beginning of January, so since the beginning of the year, we had just lost about 15 to 20 million barrels globally uh, in about two months. So if you, if you make the calculation, it's, it's just around 250 KBD uh, difference on a, daily, on a daily average basis. So really not that much. And so if you imagine that OPEC plus was before the meeting, you know, people were thinking, most, most analysts were thinking that we should expect about 1.4, 1.5 million barrels per day being back on the market from the 1st of April. Well, if you look at inventories again, it seems that it didn't really make sense. But still, I think uh, you know that came as a as a big surprise. Uh, it seems that you know it's uh, especially the one million barrels per day that 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 was uh, kind of pushed back from from Saudi Arabia. This is something that um, they themselves have the hand on, um, uh, and only themselves. And I think it's a card that they they were willing to to play coming into that meeting. And and it's something that maybe we should expect as well. Again. Uh, at the next meeting, but yes, but I think that the, the, the global, the big thing is global supply and demand balance uh, wasn't there yet for for OPEC Plus to actually allow more than one million dollars to come they back on the market. Certainly, they seem to wanted more. Rustin, I have a special headline for you in the Digest today. I've never seen anything like this. Uh, New York Times headlines, not every day they write big smashing headlines about shipping, but apparently the containers that should be in LA are stuck in Singapore and and so forth and so on. But basically the big article in the New York Times that shipping is having a real logistics nightmare. And as a result, things are not where they need to be. Your thoughts on that and its impact for the markets. You're on mute, Rustin, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, the the big undercurrent, you know, that's been back in the economic headlines has been the specter of inflation picking its ugly head up and frightening the markets. I mean, the container industry has had a very tough time rebalancing its logistics flow due to COVID-19. So you do end up with container boxes that have moved across the world, have been isolated in certain locations. They can't get out of port because either A, there have been lockdowns or lack of manpower due to lockdowns. Um, and so boxes don't get emptied into warehouses and get distributed down to the supply chain to the end user. Uh, but it's also caused a rapid increase in the price of freight because people need to move boxes back and shipping companies want to be compensated. So if you look at the whole box rates have almost gone up 200, 300% over here in the last six months, which is going to start translating into consumer price goods uh, on, on import basis. I mean, there've been a few headlines I've read um, in the UK press about uh, small mom and pop stores having to pay six, seven, eight thousand dollars for a container that normally costs them twelve hundred dollars. So when you start getting that price escalation hitting the logistics chain, it eventually ends up in the consumer's back pocket, and boom, you've got your inflation. Um, and it's what about in distillates? Is there uh, an elevated price there? Well, the distillate cracks have been under a lot of pressure. A lot of that's brought around by the jet fuel overhang that's still in the market. Uh, but when you look at the ice gas oil distillate crack at 560 this morning for April, um, that's a pretty low number for a very large industrial use fuel. Uh, part of this, of course, is you know, looking outside Geneva, it's going to be uh, 15 degrees today. So uh, winter is pretty much coming to an end and home heating demand is dropping off the face of the cliff. Uh, but you still have good demand for the light end of the barrel in regards to 0.5 fuel uh, because, you know, ships are still moving, people are still moving goods. But even that high price of fuel, you know, when you think of bunker fuel going up 7, 8, 9, 10 percent in the matter of a week and freight rates not following, well, that cost eventually starts getting passed on down the chain to the end shipper, which then gets passed on to the final goods that are sold. So, you know, this whole specter of inflation is coming out and is becoming a uh, front-facing entity that's going to start impacting a lot of things. 
Laurie, we've also a story in the digest today. Uh, Greece and Egypt reach a compromise in the East Med. There seems to be this ongoing kind of game between Egypt, Turkey and, and Greece about energy, oil and gas rights in the East Med. What does this look like? Oh, this is, uh, this is not a major story because I think the uh, issue is that there is a strong relationship and cooperation and partnership between Greece and Egypt uh, and stronger than anything. Uh, so uh, because they have the backing of the US, the EU, the uh, French, uh, they are partners in the East Mediterranean Gas Forum uh, and they have one enemy that they, they don't like uh, currently Turkey. So all of these are like small differences that could be just like uh, solved easily with communication. And today there is an East Med Gas Forum uh, meeting. I thought Turkey and, Egypt, Turkey and Egypt were kind of flirting together to uh, upset Greece. It's Turkey actually approaching Egypt and flirting, but there is no reciprocity, reciprocity there. I think like Egypt is not, uh, still not happy and they want to see more uh, action. Uh, especially not interfering in the Egyptian uh, political uh, uh, sphere and the Libyan uh, political sphere. This is what they want uh, 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 so that they, they, could, uh, they could go back to a normal relations with Turkey. But for now, I guess uh, Egypt, Tur e Egypt uh, Israel, uh, Cyprus, Greece, they're all in one, uh, they're all in one uh, uh, camp against, uh, against Turkey. The other issue that may have uh, Homeyon affected OPEC plus decision last week to hold back was the uncertainty about Iranian oil barrels coming back into the market. And we are seeing that even without sanctions relief, increased sort of sanction busting, if you like, in terms of Iranian oil making its way onto the international markets. What's the outlook for that going forward before sanctions are lifted? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so since basically since the election of um, uh, since the U.S. presidential elections, uh, the beginning of November, we've, we've started Biden seeing one, right? Biden did win, right? <laughs> it seems so. <laughs> so, yes, I mean, we've completely seen completely rigged, completely rigged, but he won nonetheless. <laughs> uh, so we've seen um, uh, Iranian oil exports pick up already. Uh, so they were uh, basically they were at um, before the elections they were staying at levels around 300 350 thousand barrels per day uh, over the previous few months and and we saw that almost double in in a matter of two three months so between November and January uh, we've seen a, a little bit of a decrease in, in February but 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 I mean that um, that is not yet definite numbers because because of the way that Iran exports its its oil and you know try to hide many of the things that they do. Uh, generally, it takes us about two, three weeks more to come up with a better estimate. But still, so yes, so we've seen a doubling of these uh, of these exports. Uh, most, if not all of them, going to, to China, which remains uh, by far the, 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 the very largest customer of Iranian oil. There's, there's little volumes that still go to the Mediterranean. So, so, so that means Is to, there a to sense Syria. Is there a sense of me on that how yeah. big how how big could this export be if Iran wanted to if they had their you know if for US was to say tomorrow we're not going to <laughs> police your exports have they the capacity to ship a million two million a day? Yes, uh, yes, I think so. Um, I think uh, first of all it comes to production capacity, which it seems that uh, I think in a matter of six months we could expect about one point five up to a maximum of two more million barrels per day uh, in additional production in, in up to, again, uh, it, it will take them about maybe six months to, to reach that. Uh, and yes, I mean, they'd be able to ship that to, to, traditional, uh, to their traditional customers, which are mainly Asian markets, so China, India, Japan, South Korea. And, and then, and then it, it'd be to the Mediterranean, Turkey, and and, and the EU. Uh, but then it really depends on the customers' will to to actually go ahead and take that risk. So as soon as, as that risk is lifted, as soon as, for example, sanction U.S. San secondary sanctions are lifted, um, I think we should expect another uptick of Iranian oil. But right now, I think the upside. Uh, so right now, until sanctions are lifted, the upside for Iranian. Uh, oil exports is quite limited. I think we could still see another maybe 100 or 200,000 barrels per day reach China. 
But apart from that, I don't think there's much more that we can expect from, from Iran, again, until other customers feel brave enough to, to, to start importing again from, from Iran. But that will, I think, is there from, from other customers. Rustin, the other issue that on the, the sort of mobility of, of, of demand for products coming back, obviously there is the uh, aviation fuel, but there is the question of will people get moving again back to offices and commuting and such things. We had a story overnight, BP announcing that their 25,000 office-based staff would be asked to work 40% of their time from home in a kind of post-pandemic uh, world. We've seen HSBC announce something similar, cutting back the size of their office space 40%. What do you think the outlook for that is and its impact on the possible demand curve going forward? I think the outlook is uh, pretty strong that we're going to see a change in people. Actually, work four to five hours, and the other four to five hours are spent in uh, coffee cup chatter, or you know, walking around, or going to have lunch, or what have you. Um, so, I, I find that you know, my own personal experience working from home um, is that it's been a very efficient way to work. I mean, technology has advanced to the point where you can get the same, if not more, productivity uh, from people. You're not commuting, so therefore, you're not wasting one and a half, two hours of your day just in the transit mode. You're actually, you know, getting up having your breakfast, sitting down, doing a little work, go have lunch. And there's clearly big savings from the employer side, right? The office space, office rent, and all of the associated costs with it. Well, that, that, that is a big savings on the overhead side, but then you also have to think of the knock-on effect of all the secondary businesses that develop around office hubs. I mean, you think yeah. of all the sandwich shops and all the people that they employ, all the coffee, uh, coffee shops, you know, that's going to be a very interesting transition in that side and how do the governments deal with that uh, inflow of potentially unemployed people looking for work. Um, well, maybe it'll become your your banned from working from home in year two of the pandemic as compared to year one where you were banned from working from your well, office. This could be this could be the revitalization of the high street. I mean you think of all the different villages that uh, right that, that seems to be a constant theme, at least in the UK, at least in here in Switzerland. You villages. mean because people are staying in their towns, they're not going into the cities. Yes. And so it could just be a, a diametric shift out of the city back into the village. And you know, it could be overall a better move for the economy and a better move for the environment. Laurie, meanwhile, back at the ranch, I'm looking for some analysis on these events that we saw in Saudi Arabia over the weekend, this geopolitical, what is this? Is this a, a part of the big rapprochement between Iran and the US feeling themselves, feeling each other out? Or is it, a, we saw this 18 months ago, of course, uh, spectacularly, the Ab Cake facility was hit pretty hard. What do you think this is? And where do you think it goes from here? Yeah, so this is a phase two or a if you want scene two of the uh, movie that we're watching now, the Iran-US rapprochement, as you said. So scene one was like the, the, the moment that Biden took over until 21, 21 February, where the Iranians were really pushing hard. There were like public statements saying that we want to go back and talk to the Americans. But we have the 21 February, which is like the deadline for the ad additional protocol implementation. After that, we don't know what will happen. So it didn't work. So now this is scene two. Scene two of that rapprochement is like, okay, we go uh, aggressive, uh, we uh, work on our proxies, uh, do the, these hits uh, constantly in Erbil, in Iraq, mainland Iraq, in, uh, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. So this is another way of the pressure uh, that the Iranians are putting uh, on, on, the, on the U.S. until the U.S. takes action in any direction, either uh, completely lifting the sanctions or part of the sanctions or whatever it is. And I think the scene too will last until the, uh, the elections in Iran. So you have until June, you will see that if no action has been taken by the Americans, because this is what the Iranians are expecting, uh, that they want the Americans to take the first move for now. Uh, we didn't see the Iranians give anything on the back of the U.S. decision to uh, not support pro, uh, proactive engagement in, in Yemen anymore or the, the sort of critique of uh, the ruler of the Saudi Arabia. The Iranians didn't see that as anything 
positive, didn't sort of give anything back for those signals. So that is because some analysts say, and maybe I agree, that uh, the Iranians are not interested in the J JCPOA anymore. They, do, they don't, they're not interested. They want something new and they don't want to stop their nuclear activity. So I think that if this is the reading and if this is the strategy now, so then definitely they're not going to take action and they will look for other uh, venues uh, to uh, talk to the Americans. Let's wait and see for now. Uh, one, one, uh, one additional information that I picked up from the news these couple of days, it's like the head of the, what is called the- uh, you pick, That the, Megan is upset, you picked that up, right? Megan is upset and- uh, <laughs> yeah. That is that is the news. Meghan and Harry are upset in their palace in Los Angeles. Yeah, so I'm I'm boring. But besides I'm, that, yeah, it's definitely I'm boring. I I don't get excited about that. So I got excited about the news that there is a general called Saeed Muhammad, who's the head of the IRGC Khatam al Anbiya Construction Headquarters. He resigned, and this is a sign that he might be running for elections. And this is a a younger generation of the revolutionary guard that might be taking the uh, the presidency. And this was one of the readings that we had that maybe Khamenei is more interested on bringing on board younger generations to take over so that it, it, it is, it, he projects what the young generation in Iran wants, etc. So I think that is an important uh, thing that I will be following up uh, during the coming weeks. Humayun, what are your thoughts on that analysis regarding the geopolitics of Iran, Saudi Arabia? And uh, Lori mentioned two phases. Is there a third? Does this get hotter before it gets cooler? I think so, because um, um, I think, uh, first of all, it's um, it's a way for from, from both sides to, to gain leverage. And I think this is what Iran is trying to do, is gain as much leverage as, as possible. And, and let's not forget that when it comes to diplomacy and, and uh, international relations, Iranians are extremely patient. And even though uh, it's true their economy is, is in the shambles and, and they, they, they would benefit very much from the lifting of sanctions, I think they are ready to, you know, to, for it to take another few months, if not even more. You know, they've shown that they can handle the situation, even though, again, the, the, you know, it's on the ground, it's 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 really mostly the the people that are, that are suffering. Um, let's say uh, rather than than the regime. Well, if you they can at, if they can get uh, up to a million barrels of export a day at seventy dollars a barrel, then they can probably hold out for a little longer. Exactly. I mean, the the more the, the, the higher oil prices go, the higher their exports go, then the. the the higher they'd be able to uh, to to take on that situation, even though um, even uh, even with you know high ore prices and high exports, it's still uh, quite difficult for them to actually access the money that they are owed uh, and 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 you know get that cash back into into the country. Uh, so I think uh, looking at the situation again, it's a way from from both sides to to gain leverage. Uh, as Lori mentioned, you know the 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 upcoming elections in in the country in June are a very important uh, event. And so I don't think we should expect any kind of breakthrough to happen before that. I think internal politics play, uh, play a lot, as, as Laurie mentioned as well. So that general that Laurie mentioned actually announced his, his, uh, his, candidate, his uh, application to the, to the, to the elections. Uh, but I think, yes, internal politics play, play, play a lot. And it seems that hardliners are very well placed to, to win it. Um, and again, you look at the local politics. Um, if I were a hardliner and I was kind of pretty sure that my side would win, I would do the most to to uphold the situation until after the elections, and then gain the credit of whether, whenever whatever sanctions get lifted, and and, and if the economic situation so improves. Th so this situation this. in Saudi Arabia could be part of that internal politics of uh, of the Iranian it, it election. Could be. It could order. be, but, uh, but at the same time, let, let's not forget that the Houthis are, are not 100% um, dependent on, on Tehran. It's true that, you know, they get, uh, they receive kind of uh, right. missiles and, 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 and other, uh, you know, um, uh, military equipment from, from them. But at the same time, they have their own agenda. So, so yes, so the, it, it could play into the regional politics, but let's not forget that the Houthis also have their own agendas and that obviously they're in a war with Saudi. So. So the, yeah. the fact of flinching well, missiles seem, on Saudi uh, can also explain it that. It does still seem amazing that they're able to get missiles from all the way over in Yemen to Dahran. That's quite a distance. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the survey question uh, for this morning to see where the view in the room is regarding getting back to work. 
it sort of looks like a lot of words, but essentially it's how many days are you going to be back in the office? After a year of positive experience with most working remotely, what could the time split between home office settle at in a post-pandemic world? Will it be 20 at home, 80 at the office, 30% at home, 70 at the office, 40 at home, 60 at the office, 50-50 or 60-40? Uh, the BP choice is 40-60, as is the HSBC one. What do you think it'll settle at? Uh, is the view here um, and welcome your thoughts on that. Um, not what you wanted to settle at, but what do you think it will settle at? Rustin, looking forward uh, to the week that's in it, Tuesday morning, as we started out, oil prices up a little uh, in Asia, but um, still struggling to hold on to that $70 handle. Do you think we can close above it this week? Um I'm highly doubtful that we will. Um, you know, it is one thing when financial flows goose the market in one direction or another. You know, the headline algo trade that pushed the market above 71 on Monday um, is far detached from the fundamentals in the oil market itself, where you actually have real demand is still lagging. Uh, there's still roughly about 73, 74 million barrels of refining capacity that's currently running, which leaves about 19 million to 18 million offline. So you haven't had any demand recovery yet that would justify a $71 price in the front. So I think it has a hard time to support plus 70. Yeah, um, yeah I think we do retrace back from this point. Um, you know, what I say in the low to mid 60s, probably more low 60s than anything else in my mind. Laurie, uh, where do you think OPEC Plus goes from here now? We're already, you know, one meeting passes, we immediately thinking of the next one because they're only a few weeks apart. So uh, it is so difficult nowadays uh, to predict what they will be doing. I guess like Amina yesterday, I guess said like, whatever you think they, should, they will be doing, you have to think the contrary. And I think I, I agree with that. And I'm so hesitant nowadays, whenever before the OPEC meetings, they ask me for interviews, I, I decline sometimes because I feel like whatever I will say, it will be the contrary. But I guess like the St. Thomas policy that the Prince Abdelaziz is, uh, is applying, which like I want to see before I believe, like I, if I see, I believe. So I guess um, maybe it, it still they might. He, wa he wants to see your see? summer holiday airline ticket. So exactly. That's the next requirement to coming on this show. You got to show your summer <laughs> airline ticket. Exactly. And doesn't look like good, right? Because one of the stories in your digest says, says like 30% of the destinations for summer destinations are still closed and under lockdowns and they have measures. So I'm not sure how much people will be able to travel. So I guess if this is it, the St. Thomas policy, uh, so then uh, until everything is back to normal and they can really see like strong recovery in demand, they will be very uh, hesitant to bring back these barrels. That we see, if, that right see if we if we get well, the <laughs> demand outlook does look you know is has its half full, half week, half empty days. Let's go to the survey result for views on that point 50 50 seems to be tipping the 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 biggest vote but of course this is spread across all the answers um it certainly will be a phasing out we'll have to see where that goes Humayun, your thoughts on the rest of the week where uh this 70 dollar handle holds or not and and where that we saw in california gasoline demand outlook picking up in in europe Britain is looking like it's opening, but the rest of Europe still in shutdown. I think I, I, I completely agree with Rustin. I think uh, the fact that, you know, you've you kind of had a top at the beginning of the week on oil prices on the news that, you know, that the Houthi missile hitting Saudi, to me, it just doesn't look that good. The fact that you've had that top already and that prices are struggling to, to keep at that level. So so until the end of the week, I'm, I'm, I'm not really positive on, on the oil price. Um, even though you, know, you never know, some so some event could happen and and turn and, and change that. Um, I think that again, uh, looking at, at the whole situation, as as Laurie said, OPEC Plus is really waiting for for real signals that that demand is picking up, and, and we're not yet seeing that at least in in global oil inventories. Uh, when it comes to the vaccine rollout. 
um, you know, it's been quite uh, relatively strong in the UK. And, and even though it was kind of weak in the EU, for example, compared to the UK or the US, I think over the, over the weekend, we've seen a lot of uh, uh, a huge vaccination campaign take place in France and Germany. So I think we may be in the, in the, in, 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 um, at the time where vaccination will pick up in, in the EU as well. And, and, and we'll start to, to catch back uh, with, you know, the, the, the UK and the US. So it's true that they'll, they'll, they'll be a bit, a few weeks behind, but they, they, will, catch their, they will catch them back. So, uh, you know, I think uh, as soon as, as this starts being more efficient and, and economies start uh, opening up, then, then OPEC Plus will have the ability to, to, to bring a few more barrels uh, on, on the market. And the fact that they are meeting every few weeks now gives them the edge in terms of flexibility to, to, to you know, change their policy if, if needed. Well, well you, it ultimately means you can never short this market, which is, I suppose, ultimately their intention. Uh, it exactly. seems they're going to move from uh, not count, they're, not, they're moving from counting inventories to counting vaccines. And that will be the number to guide how many more barrels will come. But that wraps it up for today. Rustin, thank you so much for your time. Lori and Humayun, thank you for joining us this morning. We hope you'll come back again. We got a halftime talk interview this week on two subjects, one on the future of the Brent benchmark, which, of course, uh, has got a bit of attention over the last few days because of the reconfiguration from Platts. And we also have a, an interview on the uh, U.S.-Iran rapprochement and what that might look like. So join us all on the halftime talk tomorrow. Until then, uh, have a good day and catch you all during the week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Have a good day.